Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to be talking about learning from Drupal um, and this is about implementing WordPress in a, a Drupal majority institutional environment. Um, so yeah, my name is Eric Simbrat. Um, I'm a web manager for the College of Engineering at Georgia Tech. Um, I also wear lots of other hats um, as many people in higher education tend to do. Um, I work with the Drupal Association on our uh, North America Drupal Conference, the annual North America Conference as a track chair for Frontend. I'm the president for the local Drupal users group here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm also a graduate student in a PhD program at Georgia State University. Uh, if you want to chat with me uh, after this presentation and can't find me on Slack, um, I'm on Twitter as at eSimbra and practically everywhere else on the internet as WebEx, so W-E-B-B-E-H. So you can go to my website or find me on any of the multiple Slack groups that I'm on, including WP Campus. So um, please ask questions at any time. Uh, so luckily, Crowdcast has that awesome ask a question or suggest a topic area. So just use that, and I'll answer these all at the end. Um, so today I'm going to be focusing on five main areas. Basically, a quick, quick primer on Drupal as a CMS and how it differs from WordPress, a lot of the challenges that come with working with Drupal, um, how to sell WordPress into a culture that hasn't been familiar with WordPress or has some negative connotations of it, um, a quick case study on how Georgia Tech incorporated it, and then finally, how you can actually learn from what Drupal does correctly. Yes, Drupal does some things quite correctly and quite great for web development. Um, so let's start with Drupal education. So um, if I was using uh, a Keynote on this, this would be animating, but it's not, so we'll just have to go without it. Um, Drupal's reputation, when you hear of Drupal and when you hear about it for higher education, um, most people think of one thing, and um, it's usually the first place I go when I'm talking about Drupal, and it's uh, a very popular um, web comic to which shows the learning curve for popular content management systems. So WordPress, um, spelled incorrectly, is the green one that has um, a somewhat low um, set of complexity for gaining competency and expertise in. And then you have the black bar, or the black line, which is Drupal, which is, um, as you might expect from the fairly graphic depictions of stick figures, um, a bit more complicated and difficult to work with. Um, so finding that the cliff of no return tends to be where most people give up and find another content management system we'll work with. Um, it's something that I commonly look at and something that, honestly, in my own experience has rung pretty true as well. Um, so there's a better way. Uh, so it, thinking about WordPress and Drupal, it doesn't really do either content management system justice to have it this way. However, we can look at it in a different way. So I, I like to think about Drupal and WordPress thinking about blocks or building something together. Um, so in Drupal, you can think about them as Lego pieces. Um, each Lego piece does something different, has a different shape, has a different need, um, has a different requirement for what it goes on, and then performs usually one single task, whether it be an angle, a four, four by two, a two by two, an attachment for a wheel, a laser gun. Um, and so in Drupal, you have things like different kinds of fields, like name field and email field. These are nothing but very, very small plugins that just give you a field you can place somewhere. Um, and yeah, a lot of other of these are different kinds of tools that Drupal has. And so with these combination of tools, you can do really um, uh, usable things that maybe aren't the prettiest or maybe w do one thing very well. Um, in this case, you know, your Drupal workflow and your combination of plugins can do something pretty basic and, you know, doesn't take a lot of work to put together. Or you can build something truly awesome and amazing and way, way, way bells and whistles everywhere. And it can look like this and be beautiful and does exactly what it needs in the best way possible. Uh, and that's Drupal, so you can put things together and combine them in different ways to either work great or work efficiently. And uh, I will mention that you can also do it so it doesn't work correctly and can be inefficient, but I don't really want to talk about that. Um, when I think of WordPress, I think more like an application on your phone. You don't see a lot of connections between different plugins unless they're written by the same people um, or the plugins widely, widely used and you tend to have different plugins for each thing. So in a contact form, for example, um, you've got 25 different kinds of contact forms, all of which do maybe 80% of the same thing that all have different bells and whistles. Whereas for Drupal, 
you know, this is how you build out your uh, uh, contact form in Drupal. So rather than having a single plugin that does that, you have bits and pieces. You have a form that allows you to submit a form. You've got a name so someone can type their name, an email so they can type their email, flag and rules for actions that happen when you submit it, and then an editor, bring in CK editor, so it looks pretty and people actually want to use it. Um, as you might expect, you know, these things are kind of different. Drupal's a lot more low level, and in, it's very true that it Drupal is designed really to mimic a lot of object-oriented programming, so it keeps it very low level with more component-based plugins called modules. Uh, they've been to, meant to be modular and uh, sort of pieced together um, to build something super beautiful. Um, and Drupal rarely has package deployment, so you'll very rarely see a module on Drupal that is something like a full photo gallery or a contact form. Um, there are uh, some exceptions to that, but for the most part, that's, that tends to be what you see. Um, of course, you know, with this modular structure, you come with a lot of complexity. There are many different ways of building something, um, just like with WordPress, except that what you have to do is look at the winning combination of modulars or piece of uh, plugins to do what you want to do. So th there are about you know 25 plugins that you can use to build a, uh, a contact form, but picking the right ones to need exactly what you need and make it efficient for your end users is a bit of a learning curve. Um, and so of course Drupal's built with this in mind, so even the stuff you get by default, so users, um, content types, which are the uh, WordPress or the Drupal equivalent of um, posts and pages, and even things like uh, vocabularies or reusable sets of uh, content are extendable and customizable to build what you want. Um, but that's Drupal in a nutshell. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, I could get into the nitty gritty, but I really don't want to do that because it scares off a lot of people. So I'd much rather look at um, how can a WordPress environment fit into somewhere where this kind of uh, website construction is the norm. And so before I continue, it's just worth noting that Drupal can do a lot of awesome stuff despite it having a giant, giant learning curve. And uh, so the uh, projects that I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides have zero custom code, no PHP, um, no custom templates. The only thing that I'm doing is a boatload of CSS, but if you're not doing CSS, uh, I don't think you're building a website. Um, CSS happens regardless. Um, so what I do with Drupal is things like registration for um, websites. We have something called the Inventure Prize here at Georgia Tech. It's an innovation competition for our students. Um, our undergraduate students build into teams. They submit all their information on their invention, and then we use the website basically to track the students from the time that they create their application and submit it to when they reach the national stage and they're on television in April. Um, we also do things like a boatload of applications and workflow for it. So we've got, uh, for example, for our Shore application, we have four or five step applications that are all done without doing any custom code. Um, we run wikis and download repositories for our web assets using Drupal, um, all of which have no custom code. Um, and so yeah, we use it for a lot of different things. That being said, Drupal has a lot of challenges. Um, and a common thing that we see here at Georgia Tech is, I need you to build a website very quickly for this specific project and have it do just these few things by a totally unrealistic and quick timeline. And then the question is, well, how can you do this? We need this done yesterday. How can you do this for us and do everything that we need as soon as possible? I mean, Drupal could do this and it, it is it the right tool for a very bare bones website that may be either short lived or have very few content? Um, and is it worth the resources to build up a complex website that actually has to be updated and um, that actually does very little? Especially given Drupal's, the word I'm gonna use is cumbersome update process. Um, Drupal can do multi-site. Um, it has the ability out of the box to do multi-site. However, it's very manual and base level, so you'll have to go into terminal, um, create a new uh, uh, subfolder, um, use mapping to actually create a sim link to properly point the URL to a different page, and then set up a settings.php file with the correct permissions and uh, uh, URL schemas on it. It's not very easy. Um, it, unless you have a script, it tends to be something that you can break very easily. Updates can and Drupal can be sort of automatic, and sort of automatic is uh, quite possibly the most wishy-washy wording I could use there. 
Um, but Drupal has something called uh, Drush, which is a command line that you can do um, sort of like WordPress CLI uh, that allows you to run updates there. There are also sort of middleman applications like um, Installatron that will do the same thing. But all in all, up updates really require that you go into the server and replace files. So things like core updates um, pretty much involve dragging every file and folder from the download folder into there, unless you have Drush or a command line interaction. Um, yeah, and that, as you might expect, that update process is prone to mistakes because there is one folder where if you override it in your main site when updating, it removes all your database connections. So you have to rebuild that. Um, it's frightening. And of course, um, if you've ever used Drupal out of the box, it doesn't really come configured to do a whole lot. It comes with very simple things for a basic page, which is a title in a HTML field. It has an article content type, which does the exact same thing. And they have a set preset taxonomy term list, which is just tagging on an article. And that's basically it. So you have a very small footprint to start out with for Drupal. But for if you're building a website that you actually want people to use, that requires a lot of setup just to get one site out of the box. Now, Drupal has attempted to offset that by the idea of distributions, which is more or less Drupal being pre-configured for a specific need, like for a higher education audience, um, which is WP or uh, Open Scholar, or for a government website, which is uh, Open Public. Um, all of these do something similar, but they build out the commonly used plugins and features that would be needed by someone in that use case. It's not really a stopgap, but it attempts to at least uh, offset some of the complexity there with not doing a whole lot out of the box. There's still a lot more that needs to be put in there. And really, because Drupal is so modular, a lot of what you need there is uh, based on really what your end goal is and what you want to build. So Drupal 8, which is the new release of Drupal, in the last session actually talked about how Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 um, release major releases in Drupal pretty much require you to start your websites from scratch. The update and upgrade process from major releases are non-existent or very bare bones. Uh, Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, for example, is um, being currently set up as more or less a XML or RSS feed export and import so that you move over each individual field piecemeal. Um, not the best, but it's about, the, it's about what you'd expect from something so modular and built from the ground up. So Drupal 8 has added some new things in, some um, modules like views, which I'll go over in a little bit, some things that almost every Drupal website uses into core, so every website that's built does it. Um, however, that really doesn't fix any of the last words we talked about. So those issues that I was talking about earlier still happen. Um, so that being said, you know, Drupal will never beat the demands of a website as a service without having a large amount of dedicated staffing and resources to be able to scaffold development and build out resources so that when a new website is provisioned or created, it's ready to go for novice web users and content editors so that they don't have to see the scary underbelly of Drupal's um, uh, modular design. And so thinking about that, you know, here at Georgia Tech, we don't, we are a very dis, uh, distributed and siloed uh, institution. So we don't have the dedicated staffing and significant resources centrally maintained to be able to do something like this. Um, so that being said, that's where we look for something like uh, selling WordPress to our campus. Um, so for us and how we like to look at selling WordPress to campus, is approaching um, a secondary CMS to sort of sit alongside your primary or your original content management system can benefit your community as a whole. And here at Georgia Tech, it most certainly has. So WordPress doesn't have a good views replacement. So views is the idea of a graphical uh, user interface for a MySQL query. So if you want to query a database or a table, or a specific type of content and pull specific fields or specific attributes and then rewrite them or display them to look fancy. Um, WordPress doesn't really have an equivalent without basically doing this yourself in PHP. Um, in Drupal, there's a user interface for it. You can basically query relationships between something like a faculty profile and each publication associated with that faculty profile and then build uh, their faculty staff page there and show all the things that you want and reuse that content over and over again. Um, views is really where uh, Drupal's 
largest asset and is pretty much you won't find a website built with Drupal that doesn't have views. Um, and it's what sort of sets apart Drupal from WordPress. Um, WordPress looks at a bit more at sort of building out what you need uh, within your template files within uh, some custom PHP rather than looking at it from the UI. Um, and of course, you know, WordPress in this case uh, augments, not replaces the, con uh, the primary content management system. Um, for Georgia Tech and for institutions like this that already have a well-established primary CMS, uh, WordPress provides that itty bitty spot where uh, the current primary CMS really isn't fitting in. And the use cases to which we saw that WordPress worked great for our campus were things like small websites, websites that only do one or two things but need it to be up there. Um, Plug-in focused website applications. So if you want, for example, easy YouTube embeds or Vine embeds or um, uh, Twitter feeds, Drupal can do all of those, but I'll tell you right now, they're not plug and play for any of those. You would hope that they would be and you wish every day that they would be, but they're just not. Um, brand independent websites, if you wanna have a theme out of the box that works and looks beautiful, Drupal doesn't do a whole lot of themes out of the box. What you see a lot of with uh, Drupal themes is more uh, theme, theme frameworks, much like Genesis um, and a bunch of other ones like that. So you see a lot more of foundational themes which you build on top of, and then ease of use for content creation on the web. Um, when it comes down to it, WordPress is king at this, and I don't think you'll see uh, anyone arguing against it. Drupal can do parts of it, but like I've sort of been repeating over and over again, it takes a lot of setup and a lot of fine tuning to make sure that Drupal will do anything close to what WordPress does for content creation. And so it's worth noting that your, your users likely are already using other content management systems. Here at Georgia Tech, before we started a WordPress uh, multi-site, we already had people using WordPress.com, uh, Wix.com. Um, we have a cPanel or a uh, virtual machine where users can go and provision websites. They're already doing that to install WordPress, to install Joomla and build websites off of there because they're not finding what they need in the Drupal installation or because it's too cumbersome to do. So for us, we already saw that these were being used and being hacked because it was a WordPress installation that was built by a graduate student three years ago, and now the site uh, admin or the person that knows how to update the website has left. So the user, uh, the faculty member, the new student assistant who's using it now does not know how to update it or the benefit of updating uh, the website. So you see a lot of issues there, and what we see is that um, having something centrally built and uh, available for campus reduces a lot of that um, risk of running security issues. Now, of course, WordPress multi-user, um, the multi-site of WordPress, allows the content management system to act as a service, um, so as a platform where users can uh, generate and request and approve a website um, without the admins having to do anything. They can self-provision new subsites without um, anyone who's maintaining the service to do anything, which is um, certainly a lot easier than the Drupal equivalent, which is not a one-stop shop and a one-click setup. And really, like I've been sort of pressing on the last uh, five, 10 minutes or so, WordPress really works because of its content creation tools. If we wanna reach students and write blog posts that have videos and GIFs and uh, embedded media and all that good stuff that we're looking at that we want to do when we're looking at our mobile audience or building the kinds of content that is most engaging, uh, WordPress does a majority, if not all of it, out of the box. And the O embed support that WordPress has is unparalleled by Drupal. Um, and honestly, it's a uh, user interface for the admin experience just makes it super easy for someone who's not technically competent in things like modular development or piecing together pieces to build a contact form. WordPress makes this kind of stuff super simple and really frees up a lot of the web development work that would be instead left on the uh, backs of Drupal developers across our campus. Um, and so, you know, having a secondary CMS sort of uh, flourish and sort of grab hold on campus brings up the idea of really looking at your design and development on campus as a CMS agnostic approach. So instead of focusing on one system or one platform which you hold on to for dear life for things like plugins or themes or appearance, um, looking at how to build this for adaptability and flexibility for all different platforms. So if someone's using, for example, SharePoint, 
how you can build a theme for Georgia Tech that is brand um, compliant and yet works on our SharePoint installation for um, our campus or for WordPress. And this also works to sort of scale to um, not to just systems that are out there like content management systems, but also those nitty gritty proprietary internal and legacy systems that you know exist on your campus. Whether it be a faculty or research application um, website that's sitting somewhere, somewhere on campus that is using a theme from 15 years ago, or the latest web app that one of your uh, schools or colleges or units have bought and now have a uh, sitting public facing that doesn't have any branding for your institution. So here at Georgia Tech, I've been sort of um, hinting at that we did incorporate WordPress here on campus. Um, so, you know, we our main website, which is uh, just www.gatech.edu, um, it's built using Drupal, and we use a lot of uh, most of our main websites on campus. A lot of our, um, almost all of our colleges, schools, and auxiliary services uh, use Drupal. Um, so our branding cascades down presently from Drupal. Um, so as you might expect, the branding becomes somewhat unsustainable or um, a bit fractured as you cascade down. So if you're looking at Georgia Tech's top level webpage, that screams Georgia Tech. If you're looking at a faculty blog for a specific member, that blog may not look like Georgia Tech because it doesn't have a theme because it's likely not built in Drupal or even a content management system. Um, these are things like student organizations, and I don't know why I put a comma between student organizations. I was getting comma heavy. Uh, faculty staff websites, uh, event related websites, and even special um, websites that are for temporary needs. A lot of these really don't have the full Georgia Tech branding and uh, requirements as we scale down to the smaller websites. And so I look at things like, and, and if I was using Keynote, I would point out that these are all animated GIFs, but we have a faculty member who has a website, and if you look at this one, it looks about you know 25 years old, um, but this is an information technology director here at Georgia Tech who also works in a school. Um, we've got you know ones that have a very, very, very outdated logo or color branding um, and have some really ugly looking slideshows. We've got ones that like they were built in word art uh, for the website and that are still updated. And then we have ones that look aquatic for the specific lab or center that's there. Um, you know, all of these are uh, not really the best looking websites to maintain our brand and at some point in the past took a significant amount of resources to build out this website. For example, for this aquatic website, someone spent a non-zero amount of time making sure that the active menu link on the left had a background image of a fish. Um, and as you might expect, a lot of these has accessible and responsive design issues. Um, a lot of these websites, because they're sorely out of date on the design, um, do not scale to mobile. I think the only one out of these that do is this one, and that's so solely because of its age. And if it has a long page, like a table, um, you're out of luck. Um, the rest of these really don't. And when you think about accessibility and responsiveness, that's just not only hurting our legal requirements, but also hurting our mobile viewers, which we see somewhere between 20 to 40% of our traffic comes from being mobile. Um, so for these small websites, they have you know, three basic options here. Hire a Drupal developer, either on campus or off campus, to build a website to replace what they currently have, learn Drupal themselves, or hire a graduate student to build something. And of course, um, as I say with uh, the graduate students, um, results may vary, and I think that's enough said because graduate students do leave, and they will leave your project sitting there, and they will never be able to help you again. And so WordPress is already being used on campus, and so we did an evaluation of content management systems to augment Drupal. So we used um, uh, WordPress, we used a, um, a Drupal distribution called Open, uh, Scholar, Open Scholar, which is basically Drupal for higher education, and then we used a third custom in-house solution to see what would be best for our pilot uh, pilot case and to test out to see what people would use. And um, what we found, we the reason why we included WordPress is because it was already being used. It's already being the source of outdated and deprecated websites and security vulnerabilities. 
and it's never been centrally leveraged here on campus despite being used by a majority of our student organizations and research labs here on campus. Um, so our move from decentralized to centralized WordPress um, was really an opt-in process. So more or less, we advertised the heck out of a uh, new multi-user uh, WordPress installation, which we built in-house between a couple of our schools here on campus and basically reached out to the IT and web development community as well as our communication officers throughout our institution and let them know about this uh, service. This allows users to trade off. So what we do is we give them the automated security updates, centrally maintained campus theme, which means they have Georgia Tech support out of the box, uh, single sign-on so they can use their Georgia Tech accounts, as well as some module or some plugins that have been custom tuned for Georgia Tech specific processes with the trade-off of not allowing them to install whatever plugins, themes, or configuration like custom PHP that they want. So giving them that flexibility, uh, taking away that flexibility or the ability to hurt themselves by giving them more carrots that they can then consume and make their life a lot easier so they don't have to remember multiple passwords. And so what we, uh, the results of this is that we, Georgia Tech has slowly started thinking about um, web, not as a single CMS, but as an ecosystem. So for example, for the first time in this campus since we adopted Drupal in 2009, um, we now have a static version of our current theme housed in a repository. Um, that is a drastic improvement to what used to happen, which would be a Drupal theme would then have to be dissected, pieced out, and then reconfigured for the new uh, content management system, which if you've never done that before is a, um, a bit of a nightmare, regardless of what your end platform is. Um, and we're not just thinking about Drupal, we're not just thinking about WordPress, but we're thinking about looking at the CMS ecosystem as a broad range. So WordPress has somewhat opened that door to not to looking, you know, at our assets, both in terms of our appearance, as well as our plugins for news and events repository on campus. So looking at flat file CMSs and seeing what we can do to help bridge web development for our users on campus. Um, so yeah, as of right now, we just reached, I believe, 550 websites for our faculty and staff. We currently don't allow students to build websites. Um, most of our student and student organization websites are handled through a web application called OrgSync um, that our central auxiliary or student services has uh, purchased. So we let them go ahead with that and filled in the gap for the faculty and staff that have been using Drupal and other website tools for the websites for the last better part of a decade. And so right now we're really just um, in the midst. Um, I should note that our current WordPress installation is uh, currently uh, maintained by about three folks on campus, um, all contributing, I would say, less than five hours a month, uh, mostly for security updates. But for development, we have a pretty small footprint for what uh, available resources we have. Um, but at the same time, it also works out to where we can build something that's maintainable and scalable for what we need right now and to approach the future demands of our faculty and staff. And there's my quick discussion. I got ahead of myself. Um, so when looking back at WordPress, there are a couple things that we can learn from Drupal as archaic and as sort of uh, Difficult as Drupal can be sometimes, there are a couple things that we can sort of gather from using Drupal as a content management system to look at for WordPress development. And so um, the first thing really is that Drupal's object-oriented design um, can bring good habits to your web development. Um, so despite Drupal being very heavy up front, it also forces you to think about a lot of things before you start actually building a website. Um, of course, with Drupal, you can go through and build a website from the ground up without having to think about, for example, your information architecture or your structure of your data objects on your website. But um, not doing that can be kind of a detriment to the medium to long term uh, success of your website. So we can learn a lot from Drupal's way of doing things to try to make our lives as web developers, web maintainers, administrators, um, even uh, administration and executives to make our lives a lot easier in the web ecosystem. 
Um, so object coupling really is the first one. I'm making sure you know where your connection between custom content types or between custom fields is very clear. So having that information architecture uh, spec'd out, uh, drawn out, and making sure that you know where each of your pieces of content on your new website are coming from, where they connect with one another, and how they're being reused across the website is incredibly important. And I, I think it's you know even more important to consider you know uh, the idea of not repeating yourself whenever you're building a website to make sure that when you build a piece of content once it's being reused everywhere it needs to be rebuilt. So if you're building, for example, I always like to use the example of a faculty or staff uh, profile page. If that faculty or staff profile page also needs to show up under a research area page for um, a list of faculty associated with the research area. That's where your information architecture comes in to make sure that that content's being reused. Now, of course, in Drupal, it's a bit easier to do. Um, if you could see me right now, I'm doing air quotes around easier. Um, but it's something to note so that as your end users start to add this content, they're not having to edit five different places when a faculty member leaves or when they change their job titles or when they get a new award so that you can do that once and be done with it because it's going to happen. It's going to happen a lot. And of course, the idea behind this uh, information architecture is thinking about for each piece of content that's on the web page or even each field on a piece of content, where does it inherit from, where does it extend to, thinking about where this content actually connects with one another to save yourself a lot of headache down the road. Uh, two would be looking at component uh, level design. So thinking about basically um, uh, building uh, your website component by a component um, rather than intermixing all of them, uh, making sure that you have the correct plugins that work for a specific component and that you're not reconfiguring things. Um, and this really works out so that as you uh, add new iterations or updates um, or replace with a new workflow that you're not breaking every other part of the website. So for example, for a um, uh, specific school or college website, if you have a boatload of forms and you're finding that those forms are a detriment to your public website, it may be worth looking at splitting that up so that the workflow for your forms is drastically different than the workflow for your website. It's a bit more important in Drupal, but for WordPress, making sure that your external data sources, um, that information is being piped in correctly and that it's scalable enough so when that external data source changes, or when something on that changes, it's super simple enough for you to change it. And that's really to think about building those custom components with chunking in mind. Um, so much like with Drupal's modular approach, um, if you're building a custom theme for your institution, make sure that those pieces of uh, that custom theme, like your search area, like your footer, like your header, like your um, branding assets for your header icon for whatever institution, college, or school you're on, are chunked enough so that replacing them requires you go to one place, replace just that, and everything else in the theme still acts as needed. Um, we've run into this issue a lot at Georgia Tech because um, uh, we're finding that our theme is somewhat organically changing a lot quicker than we expected and sort of in the strangest places. So finding those changes that work both for accessibility requirements to make sure that all those changes take into account um, new tags for 508 compliance or making sure that our footer is flexible and has enough um, variability to meet the different demands of our end users. Um, and yeah, the benefits of these Lego blocks can be massive. So I, I, like I was saying, what happens when your style guides change and then you have to change out your theme, um, whether that be you know the color of your links or what your footer looks like, and yet maintain what your header currently has. Um, and of course, with legal requirements, we just had the federal government uh, pass down the new, more stringent uh, accessibility requirements for websites. So looking at how those ne uh, necessitates change and how your different components or modular design for your custom work can take that into account so you're not having to rebuild your theme or your plugins from the ground up. You can just change out one component, uh, switch that out, um, incorporate it back into the fold, and nothing changes from the end users and your theme to, or custom code doesn't break. Um, and then finally, building for your end users, and I think that this is probably the most important thing. Um, and really, it's something that can be sort of both ways, both learning from Drupal as well as learning from WordPress, is that content editing should always be left to the content editors unless otherwise necessary. 
unless there's no way for you to do it, you know, streamlining that content creation process as much as possible, even if it requires you to do a little bit more work with your custom uh, hooks or filters or templates, um, save you a lot of headache in the long term. Uh, Drupal sort of uh, scaffolds this by really exposing a lot of your data types, your content types, your pre-built vocabularies or pre-selected lists, your user accounts to be scalable and to have custom fields as needed, but to have this as simple so that when someone has to add a new, uh, for example, uh, call to action button or a call to action section on a page, they don't have to include HTML. Um, uh, making it as simple as possible so that instead of using HTML, they're using something like short code or whatever the equivalent would be to make it so that there's zero room for mistakes and I think more importantly, zero uh, room to break something and have the entire theme break um, or the entire website break, which is something that tends to happen more and more. And then really this allows you to free up your time from doing work, from adding content um, from being the content editor or the advanced content editor to actually work on projects, much like our last presentation in this room did. This gives you the time to do awesome things like bring in interns, or, excuse me, interns, and onboard them using a uh, you know pretty lengthy experience and have them actually learn how to do the fun things in web development and not the nitty gritty. Um, so yeah, that's a very big primer on Drupal and WordPress. Um, so. You know, I encourage you to go out and take a look at Drupal if you haven't, um, and also take a look at what Drupal does correctly. If you've never seen views in action, um, I encourage you to really go find a video of someone using views to do something awesome in Drupal. And it is really mesmerizing. But um, just finding out, you know, where you can benefit from Drupal as well as where you can benefit from really a CMS agnostic design for your institution, for your unit, or for your group. Um, yeah, so that's basically what I just said. Awesome. So to, um, I'll go through the questions that are already here on our wonderful Crowdcast. We've got three right now. Um, so the first one, I'm going to start from the bottom up, um, go to the one that's got the least amount of votes to the one that has the most votes. Um, Brian asks, uh, do you have people on campus building their own WordPress websites outside of your centralized service? Uh, the answer to that is yes, but for a lot of our um, schools and colleges, we tend to see them using more of our uh, software as a service rather than going through the process of requesting a virtual machine uh, through a web hosting service, using Installatron to install WordPress, and then figuring out where to go for the Drupal theme or for the WordPress theme because we do not provide that theme uh, publicly because um, we're trying to discourage people from basically using that on any WordPress um, website they have. Now, of course, they can request that theme if they really want to. Um, however, we really don't make a habit of it because we currently don't have it piped into any kind of update workflow. So the theme's never checking for updates to an outside source. So that, for example, when we make accessibility changes, we'd much rather make it one place. Um, however, in a perfect world, I would love to have this where it update all sites at once. However, because of our incredibly limited staffing needs for this, it's just something that hasn't taken priority. Um, so the answer is yes, a little bit, but what we see a lot more is we tend to see a lot more people leveraging, this, especially within the schools and colleges, to build it for their lab centers and for everything they need there. Um, so uh, how do we get rogue sites to join, uh, sorry, so Kelly asks, uh, how did you get rogue sites to join the fold? Those wordpress.com slash Wix sites, frowny face, uh, policy recommendations. Um, so the short answer to this is Georgia Tech is slowly working on uh, implementing some web policy. However, because we are so siloed, the policy is not so much a policy, more recommendations. Um, I wouldn't even put it so far as requirements. It's kind of the downside of having a super siloed um, infrastructure for web development across campus. Uh, there is an effort to push that, but honestly, I would never see that policy recommendation actually going to the small research centers and requiring them to use one of these services. Really, what we use here is we look more about the carrots and the opportunities to make their lives a lot easier for these sites. So encourage, for example, Georgia Tech branding, um, focusing on Georgia Tech login, the security of having um, all their content remain on campus, as well as uh, what's funny is actually the most important requirement for a lot of people tends to be the 
their name .edu email or uh, website URL. And that really tends to bring a lot more people in the fold from those WordPress.com Wix sites than anyone else. And because our DNS team is a bit stringent on who they give domains to, i.e. it has to be a on-campus um, supplier, uh, you can't point you know, a Gotech edu to a Wix website because that is just frightening. Um, that's really more of what we've seen. Um, I think policy would really depend on the kind of institution that you're in. If you're in more of a uh, centralized institution where you have centralized web and centralized uh, workflow for requesting a website, that might be an easier way around it um, because you have a more stringent policy and because you don't have the avenues for folks to build their own websites. Um, uh, I'm going to go with uh, JB Christie's uh, question about are there any stats that address how much it costs to develop for and support WordPress versus Drupal? Um, I haven't seen any recently. I don't look too hard at those because they tend to change for whatever outlet they're at. And I most some of the ones that I've seen for some of our partner institutions in the university system of Georgia are supplied by a firm that is pushing a particular content management system to sell their um, support plan. So I don't really put that much stock in it. Um, I can tell you right now from what I've seen from dealing with WordPress at an institution versus Drupal at an institution, um, I've worked in higher education here in the university system at Georgia for about six or seven years or so. And I've been at institutions both as a graduate student and as an employee um, that use WordPress, Drupal, and a mix of those two. And what I find is that really um, the cost of developing for and supporting Drupal tends to be a lot more simply because um, because you have that wider tool set, you're, you can be a lot more dangerous in Drupal and aim your sites a lot higher. So rather than um, build, uh, purchasing a lot of applications for some of the stuff we do, like for our news, a daily news service, we end up doing um, a lot of that in custom Drupal websites. So our daily digest email that goes out to all faculty and staff come out with Drupal. Um, and so that application, you know, is a little flimsy, it's a little flaky, but at the same time, it's something that requires a good bit of technical expertise to keep up. Um, so I would say Drupal all in all is a bit more expensive. All right, let's see if we get a couple more and I've got about three minutes left, so that's perfect. Um, so the question from Sarah is, how do you handle training and support for end users who may maintain websites in both platforms? So we don't have a central method of training. Um, in fact, here on campus, we don't at all. Um, Georgia Tech has largely pointed people to lynda.com for training because we have a campus-wide license for it. It's not the best. Um, both our Drupal users group on campus, which is about uh, 60 or 70 web developers and content editors across campus, as well as our um, WordPress team. Oh, someone's calling me. Um, those folks actually, both units run their independent training um, and support. Um, for the Drupal, it's a listserv and um, bi-weekly meetings that um, have training sessions there. And for WordPress, it is a listserv and um, a monthly uh, open help desk. So we don't have anything connecting because there aren't a lot of things that push over from platform to platform. But um, sort of as, as we move into things like Drupal 8 and look at sort of consolidating our resources to get less uh, siloed and look more component based, I think we'll start to see a move that way. However, for end users, the difference between, for example, Drupal and WordPress is night and day. Um, training for how someone creates a piece of content on Drupal is gonna be drastically different than how they do for WordPress. Um, finally, we have a question from Jared saying, do you ever have departments who don't wanna use the university theme because they wanna be a unique brand separate from the university? Yes, yes we do. Um, we see this a lot and uh, it's a bit of a, uh, Oh, interesting topic. Um, really, the way that I look about um, university branding is um, most of our exceptions are there because of um, older legacy decisions that have been made. Most of our uh, units uh, don't really have the resources to be able to brand themselves separately. Um, so when looking at the mass amount of projects that they have for each college or school, they see that they'd much rather spend time working on those projects rather than reinventing the wheel for a Georgia Tech theme that's available. Um, and that's really the way that it's gone so far. Um, 
there are a couple examples that have fallen through the cracks there, especially when you get down into things like uh, entrepreneurship for startups, um, labs and centers. We see a little bit of that. Um, but when it comes down to there, uh, what we've learned is that having minimal requirements for university theme requirements to push accessibility and for legal um, requirements tends to do good and um, it's not widely adopted, but the, the option is there if needed um, so that they can pipe in for that. So um, it looks like I'm right out of time. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be in the uh, WPC online Slack channel. Um, if you have anything else you want to talk about, otherwise, I think that's it for me. So what I'm going to do is to attempt to go back into the room that my other uh, browser was in and turn this off. So thank you so much for uh, joining and listening, and I uh, look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you very much.